Hello, Foothills Church. Thanks again for joining us this week. We're always excited to have you with us online. So thanks for joining us. Hopefully you can also come Sunday at 945. We'd love to see you. But let's worship together today in Jesus' name. Yeah. 
every battle Through every heartbreak Through every circumstance I believe that you are my fortress And you are my portion You are my hiding place I believe you are
God is changing us every single day. And one day we're going to be forever changed in his glory. Folks, thank you for joining us again. We will see you next week. Hey church, we're so excited to have you here online and we just encourage you that if you've been coming online that you should join us in person. We have so much fun here at the church. Our service starts at 9.45 and we'd love to see you next week here in service. Here are some announcements and Corey Gaffari is going to be reading scripture. Hey guys, it's Pastor Owen. I'm coming on here to just get the ball rolling for camp. So the deadline to sign up is June 16th, so I need to see you and your student right after church. The camp cost is $350, but we're wanting to bring that cost all the way down to zero, so your student can earn camp cash, 15 hours worth in kids ministry, and then they can help out with VBS and receive all the hours that they need to go to camp for free. VBS is just around the corner. Can you believe it? It was actually one of the first volunteer roles that I did when I first came to the church 10 years ago. I love VBS so much that I would fill every role, but they told me that I can't. So I need your help. We especially need your help in these three areas. Security. Hey kid, what are you doing out here? Where's your group leader? I'll go help you find them. Registration. Hi, good morning. Let's get you all checked in. And group leaders. Hi friends, I'm so glad you're here today. Are you ready for some fun? This is such a fun event. You're not gonna wanna miss it. You can register on the church app from your phone right now. Remember, we can't do this without you. Good morning, church. Today I'm reading from 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 11 and 12. Thanks, Corey. That was awesome. And here's Pastor David with an amazing message, and I hope you enjoy it. Hey, everybody. It's me, Pastor David. Thanks for allowing me into your home or your phone or wherever you're watching me right now. Appreciate it. Uh, Pastor Mark and Pastor Joni are not here this week, so we're going to do uh, worship and sermon on Sunday without them. We're going to miss them. They will be back next week. And uh, as usual, thank you very much for joining us. I would love to start with prayer. So unless you're driving, if you could bow your head with me, let's bring this before the Lord. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the time that you give us. We thank you for this morning. We woke up to a beautiful sunrise that you gave us air in our lungs. We are appreciative of everything that you've given us, every blessing that you've given us, Lord God. Help us keep that in perspective, just the gift of life that we thank you for. I uh, pray that today what you have on my heart to say, I pray that I will be able to say it clearly. Uh, I pray that those who need to hear it will be blessed by what you want us to say. Thank you for your word. I love your word. I love the instruction that you give us. And uh, just be with us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Well, today I'm, I'm really excited because I don't usually do this, but my three main points all start with the same letter. I'm like super proud. So Pastor Mark is rubbing off on me and I'm going to talk about three things today uh, in alliteration, flee, follow, and fight from 1 Timothy chapter 6 verse 11 through 12. Now, I don't do this often. I'm going to start with two quotes. And here's what I mean by I don't do this often. I wish I could say, you know, like Ben Franklin said this. I have no idea where these quotes came from. I saw them online. I liked it. It fit what I wanted to say. So I'm going to pretend I'm on Facebook, just do a quote and act like it's authoritative. So two quotes today that I think are relevant to what we've been talking about. And it has to do with strategy. See, we've been talking recently, the last two weeks, about the strategy of the enemy, uh, about the deception that the devil tries to get us to take on, and then the flat out lies that we sometimes will take in and internalize and personalize, and it's just to our detriment because we have an actual enemy. And here's what it is, because I wanna look at, okay, what do I do then to fight back? What can I do to help, to, what, what does God give me uh, to give me a better ability to stand up and withstand the attacks of the enemy? So I was reading something that was from a, uh, it was a military, strategy magazine. And here's what they said. They were talking about the role of the enemy in strategy. The first one is that strategy is inherently adversarial. In other words, if I'm strategizing, I'm not just trying to make a plan to, to reach the goal. I have to keep, because that's the second quote, strategy always keeps the enemy 
in mind. I'm not just trying to get a goal. I am fighting against an opponent whose role or whose motivation is to keep me from achieving my goal. So if I'm thinking about strategy, I have to incorporate the enemy. Because as you talk about this kind of stuff and you're like, I don't want to give the devil too much credit. I want to focus on the devil, all that kind of stuff. That's fine. But if we, if we look at almost every analogy in our world, when it comes to winning something, when it comes to, to a struggle or a fight or something, we have some goal that we have, and we have many, many goals in Christ, then the enemy, we have to know the strategies of the enemy in order for us to beat this opponent. And it's very clear in, in the military sense, right? When we're, we're making a strategy, we, we know very clearly there is an enemy trying to stop us from reaching this goal. Uh, it's also in sports. If you're playing sports, you, you, are, you are studying the tendencies of your opponent. I mean, it's a different kind of adversary than in the military, but it's the same kind of attitude. It's the same kind of idea. I have to figure out the best way to win, and I have to know the tendencies of the opponent that's trying to keep me from reaching my goal. And in fact, the Bible, is, I think it's true in sports. I think it's true in business sometimes. And, and there's, there's healthy competition in this world. I think that's a good thing. I think in many times of life, uh, when we think about strategy and strategizing in order to achieve our goal, we have to keep in mind, not just the who, but what obstacles are in our way and how do we engage those opt- obstacles to get where we need to go. So scripture very explicitly connects the Christian life, both with like a military analogy We are a soldier and we are seeking to please our commanding officer. And it also connects it to uh, kind of sports, athletics, athletes who are training because they want to win. See, we're told we have an adversary. That's why you don't want to give the devil too much credit. But the Bible does tell us that he's there and that he's working against us. First Peter 5, 8 says this, be alert and of sober mind. This is kind of like keep your head up. Keep your eyes open. Make sure that you're vigilant and not lackadaisical in your everyday life because you have an enemy. Your enemy, according to 1 Peter 5, 8, a real and personal devil who prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. So his goal is, your, is, is to completely end you. You're gone. Completely devoured. In fact, we've been talking about the thief in John 10. The thief has a single goal and it's, it's three-pronged. To steal to kill and destroy, to steal your joy, to steal your hope, to steal your future, and thereby to kill you and destroy you, obliterate you completely. Or like we see in 1 Peter, that you are devoured by the fear, by the lies of the enemy. So it's something we have to keep in mind. We have an actual adversary. Therefore, my strategy has to keep this adversary in mind. I cannot forget the devil. I cannot act like it's no big deal. I have to look and see and figure out the best way to reach the goals that God has called me to. Now, I realize I'm a part of it. Thank God it's not all on my shoulders, right? If I look at strategy and resource, I have unlimited resource in the God who has called me and equipped me to win. But I am still tasked with using the resources God has given me, training myself to win this battle. So if I have an enemy, this is important to me, okay? If I have an enemy, I'm in a fight, I have to keep that in mind. Here's why I have to keep that in mind. I'm not a really good fighter. I mean, I know you look at me, I'm in peak physical form, so you would think he probably holds his own. But really, I'm not. I'm not a good fighter. I have like two growing knees and then I run away. That is my entire fight. That's what I would do. So I have to think, okay, what can I, someone who's not a natural fighter, not a good fighter, I mean, I've seen good fighters. They're impressive. That's not me. So if I'm in some kind of struggle, if I have an enemy against me, I need a strategy. So like, Lord, what can I do? Someone who's not, it's not that you don't naturally have the desire to win. It's not that you don't have fight in you. But if you think just just those general analogies, there are some people who almost any kind of struggle, physical or otherwise, that they're in, they're going to come out victorious because that's just the way God wired them. So I I personally have to think about this just a little bit more. So, So my contention this morning is that Paul gives us, God's word gives us by extension, a three pronged strategy to fight the, the plans of the enemy. And here's what it is. He's writing to his trainee, Timothy. It's in 1 Timothy chapter 6. And he's, he tells him three things that he wants him to do. He's saying these are important as you're fighting against your adversary. And, he's, and it's this. These are the three, the three strategies I believe God has given us. One is flee. The second is follow. And the third is fight. Very, very important. So he's talking to Timothy about the kinds of people he's going to run into, the, the kinds of people we see all the time. 
And he's talking first about their motivation. These are people who are, they're conceited, argumentative, they're seeking power, they're seeking money and wealth, so they're greedy. It doesn't mean that wealth in itself is bad, but the, the fact that that becomes your entire motivating factor, that, that's a trap, that's a snare of the enemy. So greedy, gossip, argumentative, conceited, all about themselves. He kind of gives this list of, of what people can be like. And here's what he says, this is the first strategy. You, man of God, flee from all of this. Flee from all of this, from any kind of temptation that might threaten to suck you in because of the lies and the deception of an enemy who is also strategizing against you with no less of a goal than to devour, steal, kill, or destroy you. This is important. So I got to really, really take note of what I'm being told. And, and you might think, okay, flee. That's my, that's, maybe it's not what you expected. Flee. So the first thing I'm supposed to do is run, is run away. All right. I think running away, I think fleeing, and it's a very strong word, right? He doesn't say, just watch yourself win. He doesn't say, do your best to kind of avoid, right? Just, just drive safely. He's not saying that. Flee, get out of the situation. This is a big, strong word. And I think there's a few reasons for this. Here's why I think he's using the word flee. One of the things that to flee, to flee from sin, to flee from even these temptations, it's not even sin. We flee before sin has the opportunity to get full grown and get its hooks in us. We flee at the earliest possible point. And I think when we flee something, it takes the danger seriously. And I have a picture here of the strong current. Uh, we went to Monterey once. We were looking at the waves. Gosh, they were gorgeous. I love living near Monterey. And, and they were so big, it was almost like they were slow motion. And my, me and my family were on the beach, and it was obviously too big to swim. And the little sign, those signs were everywhere. Warning, strong current, strong current. We're just sitting there watching the waves. And one of the, this, we were at one of the state parks, and uh, one of the guys comes over in his uniform. He's like, hey, you guys need to stay away. And, and you know, part of me is like, well, of course, I'm not going get, to get away. He's like, you're too close. And I was like, you think it's going to just suck us under? And I was a little bit annoyed, and I had to remember... And I'm a Christian, so I should be nice. So I was nice to him. And, uh, and I thought through it. He said, he said, hey, you don't realize, first of all, how quickly this can, this can change, how quickly the tide can move, but even how small the waves have to be before they pull you in. And that was intriguing to me. And then I realized, you know, the dude's doing his job. He's trying to help us out. And if I was, we were kind of like moving up as close as we can get just because we were in awe of the power of the waves, which means we were not taking the inherent power of the waves Seriously enough, the danger to our lives uh, based on just where we were. See, because there's a flip side to some of the deception and lies that we've been talking about. Last week, we talked about the lies of the enemy that make you want to feel like you're a lost cause and you have no hope and therefore you should just give up. The flip side of the lie that you have no hope is I can handle it. You ever said that? You ever thought it? Oh, I, can, I can handle this. See, remember, flee is, it's huge. It's a, it's a different word than avoid. God is telling us, you need to get as far away as possible. Put as much distance between you and this kind of life as you possibly can. Don't hesitate. Don't try to figure it out. Don't try to ask for advice. You have to know enough about the temptation and the wiles and strategies of the enemy that the second you see something that's endangering you, get out turn around and run the other way. And you hear it and you might think, okay, I thought we weren't supposed to live in fear. And you're not. You are absolutely not supposed to live in fear. I believe, and I would argue, that running away, not walking away, not sauntering away, not even backing away, turning around and running away from unhealthy words and habits and choices is actually a form of wisdom. And you know what? Every single person that has ever struggled with addiction will tell you the same thing. Every single person who struggled with things like substance abuse, abuse will say, no, I don't, have to go. I don't have to go to that party. Really, all your friends are going to be there. They know you're on your, your, they know you're on your 20 year. No one's going to tempt you. No, I just, I don't need to be in that situation at all. I'm just going to avoid it completely. And you can tell me that I'm overreacting or over responding, but I know that because of what I've done before, I am going to make sure that I'm as far away from possible from the temptation itself. You ever notice when Jesus gives us the Lord's Prayer, he doesn't say lead us not into sin. He says lead us not into temptation. See, once we're flirting with the temptation, it is so much easier to jump right into the sin. We have to start these boundary lines a lot earlier than we often do. 
And it's important to keep this in mind. Retreat, hear me really clearly. Let's do, use another military strategy here. Retreat is not the same as surrender. In military parlance, there is a phrase that you may have heard before. It's called tactical retreat. To retreat means you need to back away from where you're at so that you can get into stronger, more steady, more firm ground so that you can again face the enemy. To retreat, this is why I think church is so important, right? Retreat allows you to regroup, reposition, and receive backup. See, and I tell my guys every Tuesday night, the guy, not my guys, God's guys, every Tuesday night at the Forge. See, I think that is one of the most important things we can do at this church. Because we move from the back of someone's head, right? When we're at church sitting there, we're seeing the back of their head. And we move into a circle and we're talking to each other and we're getting to know each other. And we're, we're knowing about each other's lives and we're praying for each other. And we're studying God's word together and we're encouraging one another. I have an entire group that backs me up. And I cannot do that sometimes in certain situations without running away from the situation and finding people who will hold me accountable and encourage me and strengthen me in Jesus. Retreat is not permanent. Retreat is not surrender. So I just think life would be a whole lot easier for us if we treated sin the way we treat poison oak. I've never known anyone who flirts with poison oak. We don't treat sin that way. We treat it like a donut, you know. I shouldn't. You know, you'll feel bad if you eat it. Oh, but it's so beautiful and glistening and awesome, right? But it's not a donut. It's poison oak. And it would be really, really smart of us to realize when you go near, see, I don't even know what poison oak looks like. I'm really, I told someone that once recently. Oh, watch out for that area because there's poison oak. I said, oh, it's, I'm okay. I don't even know what it looks like. So I'll be fine. So no, but if I knew what it looked like, the smart people are like, ooh, I'm not just going to make sure I avoid it. I'm going to walk a, a circuitous route as far away from that as possible because I've seen the destruction that it causes in my life. Some people, it gets in their lungs. It's a horrible, horrible feeling. We just talked to someone on, the, on Tuesday night, one of our guys at the Forge, and he said, you know, you know what keeps me away from the life I used to live? I like my life now. I've seen my life when I'm immersed in sin, and I've seen my life when I'm trying to please God. There was a huge difference, and I will not risk trading with the joy that I have now. So that's why I think flee is the very first thing we're supposed to know, supposed to do. The second strategy, follow. So in my strategy against the enemy, against a very real adversary, I flee the times I need to flee and the things I need to flee, and I follow what I need to follow. Here it is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. Pursue, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. When I say no to one thing, I'm saying yes to something else. Very, very specifically, very clearly. What kind of things are going to fill my time as I'm fleeing from sin? See, if I run away, if I just run away, and that's the only part of the strategy I have, then I'm not running towards anything. I'm just running around aimlessly, right? I, I don't know if you've ever ran away from a mouse. I, of course, have never ran away from a mouse because I'm a tough, manly guy, and I just get that mouse. But if I ever did, I probably wouldn't have an actual destination. I'm just... I'm just running around. And I think that's, that's possible for us to do. We're just, that's why it's not just fear. This is a strategy, not a response. I'm going to say that again. That's not in my notes. And that was really good. You can quote me on the internet and pretend it was said by Benjamin Franklin. It is not a, it is not a response. This is a strategy. Because when we retreat or when we flee, we do, sto we do so tactically. We do so, so strategically. We are going somewhere. I have to flee from something and run towards something else. Because the other side of that is if I'm just running around aimlessly. In fact, Paul even talks about this in 1 Corinthians. I'm not running around aimlessly. I'm not fighting as if I'm just boxing the air. You have no vision. You have no direction. And that means I'm not categorized by fear. There is a point to my motion to pursue something or really to pursue someone gives me a direction. See, it's another strong word, isn't it? Flee is a strong word. It's not avoid. It's not be careful. It's run away. Pursue is the flip side of that. I'm not just slightly walking towards God. I'm not just slightly, sometimes, occasionally, when circumstances call for it or allow. You know, maybe I go to church once for the next six months. It's not, it can't, I can't do this half-heartedly. To pursue is the flip side of the word flee. I'm going to do this with every bit of me, with every part of my heart. 
with the same kind of, of intensity that I run away from things that are unhealthy, I have to run towards a God who is training me to be righteous. I have to. It's when we pursue things, and there are things in your life that you have pursued. When I first started playing guitar, I was looking for every possible opportunity to play just so I could learn, just so I could learn something new. I have a little keyboard in my house, and I have three young kids, so I barely get a chance to just sit there and play keyboard. So every so often, like really late at night, when I think everyone might be in bed, I'll turn on the keyboard and, and I'll start playing. Every opportunity to get better, to learn, to, to enjoy the skill that God's developing in you. Of course, then I play and and uh, they tell me to be quiet because they're all trying to go to sleep. So it doesn't always work. Um, you know, I played guitar so much that I got bad grades in school. That was dumb. But the, the goal, the, the development of the skill that I had, because I took as many opportunities as I could to learn and to get better. What if we, there are some people that, that do this with guitar or piano or music, and they're practicing like eight hours a day. It's a full-time job. And of course, they're a lot, they're a lot better. I tried, I tried learning the other day the uh, Hotel California solo and I got to like note one. I mean, that was bad. I, I, I can play it really well on air guitar, but you know, you have to really, really take some time to, to get into this stuff, to really, really, to get better at it. I mean, this is, a, this is a practice thing as we pursue and practice godliness and righteousness in our life. What if we looked actively for opportunities to be godly? What if I looked for ways to secretly bless others, times where no one knows except for God? What if I woke up in the morning and asked God, what would you like me to do for you today? See, that's why it's not, it's not just pursue. It, that's why I said follow. That's why I said follow. If in Luke 18, someone asked Jesus a question and he starts by saying, good teacher. And Jesus says, why do you call me good? There's no one good except for God alone. And he's implying, if you're calling me good, you're calling me God. And that's absolutely correct. All righteousness, goodness, love, faith and gentle, everything that we're supposed to pursue, it is there in the person of Jesus who is available for us to know. So to pursue righteousness, it's not a what I pursue, it's a who. I, I run away from sin by keeping my eye on Jesus. I don't know if you know that uh, William Shatner went to space. William Shatner, when he was 90 years old, uh, went, went on a rocket and went up into space for a little bit. This I love, because I, I grew up watching Star Trek, the old Star Trek and the, the next generation. There's this weird, you know, fight between people who like Star Trek and who like Star Wars. I don't know why. I don't know why you can't just like them both. And it, also because everyone knows Star Trek is, is the best. So um, William Shatner went to space recently, 90 years old, very excited. Everyone's excited. I think they just made a documentary of it on Prime. And it's uh, Captain Kirk went to space. Here's what I find interesting about this video, because I watched him being interviewed. Uh, there's a video of it. And I watched him being interviewed afterwards. He's 90 years old and they're talking to him. He says, you know, everyone was up there and they were excited about weightlessness. So they're playing around. Everyone's doing flips. Uh, they got Skittles and they're, they're throwing Skittles, trying to get Skittles in someone's mouth. And, and, and you can see it in the video. Everyone's running around being crazy. And he's sitting there just watching the earth. He's like, it's so, it was so breathtaking. And he said this, I didn't want to do flips or, or throw Skittles, right? I wanted to sit and watch the, the beauty of earth. And he was, you know, he wasn't smart enough to give his glory to the creator, but he was aware enough of the beauty of what God had created. And he realized it would, it would be a waste of time to be distracted by flips and skittles. When you have a once in a lifetime chance to look at the majesty of the earth. And it's really intriguing to watch this in video form. He's just sitting there, doesn't care, doesn't care. And I say this because I think this is what God's saying when he says follow, when he says pursue. Run away from sin. Run away from all this other stuff. Pursue Jesus. Keep your eye on what's important. Don't lose sight of it. Everything else, it's, it's distraction. Next time you think of flips and skills, I just want you to think, mm, it's not worth it. I need to keep my focus on what's important. All right, we have one more strategy. Our final strategy, according to God's word, is fight. And some of you are made this way. Some of you have been waiting for this. Sometimes I think God's tempering us just a bit. Don't fight yet. Don't fight until you have the proper boundaries in your life. Don't fight until you know the places to avoid. Otherwise, you're going to go in recklessly and expose yourself and you're going to get hurt. Know what to avoid and know to keep your eye on your commanding officer, which is Jesus. Then, then, because remember, retreat is not, is not a surrender. At some point, you turn around and with every bit of you, it is time for you 
to face the enemy. To face the enemy that's trying to keep us from our goal, from God's goal in us. With our unlimited resources of an amazing God who has given us his grace and his power and his Holy Spirit. But now this is where we fight the good fight of faith. Now it's time. And you need to have those kind of, we all have this in our amygdala, this fight or flight process. This thing that we says, I'm, I'm going to stand my ground and I'm not going to move. God has put that inside of you and we are supposed to apply that to our walk with him. We have to. This is where the hard work comes. There is, there is hard work in Christianity. Pursuing Jesus, it takes effort. It takes time. It takes intentionality and it takes purpose. And in that, just like in anything else that takes hard work, there is so much reward. And we cannot give up too early in the challenges that God has given us. So I'll give you an example. I grew up in uh, San Diego, high school in San Diego. And uh, the, the big sports team we all went to watch other than the Chargers were the Padres, San Diego Padres. And, I, and the big uh, Mr. Padre they called him was Tony Gwynn. I actually went to high school with his son. So Tony Gwynn was a, now I don't know much about sports, so I had to look him up about what was, I knew he was good. I didn't quite know like what he, so he won, according to Wikipedia, he won eight batting titles in his career. Didn't know they gave those out, but he won eight of them. And it says he was tied for the most in National League history. So that's good, good for him. He was really, he was really, really important to the Padres and to that team. And I, you know, I got to see him at his 3,000th time at bat. It was really cool. We used to go, it was the Jack Murphy Stadium, then it was Qualcomm Stadium. Now they're at Petco Stadium downtown. I'm saying this to try to impress you. I know just a little bit about sports. But recently, his son, Tony Gwynn Jr., who I went to high school with, um, he was talking about his dad. And he said, you know what? What made my dad great? Other than the fact that he was a really good family man, he said. Uh, made sure that, that uh, he would say, made sure that me and my sister got to spend time with him. But he said, boy, he took time to make sure he was a really, really good at what he was doing. He would watch, he said, he said, it's all about the things that people didn't see. He said he'd watch his own swing frame by frame over and over and over for hours and hours and hours. He'd watch the way the pitchers threw the ball. He would study it. He would, he would like intensely so that when he came out and hit his home runs and, and he, he was just, he was an amazing hitter. Um, all of that greatness, basically, is what his son was saying. Everything that you saw, that was because of the things you did not see. It was because of all of the hard work he put in. See, Tony Gwynn, like all these other athletes that we look at and we admire, just, it's not just their skill. It's their determination. I mean, you can't do most of this without the talent, right? Without the natural talent, the natural ability that God has given them. But those that really, really stand out are those that take the time to hone that ability and strengthen those, those talents that God has already given us. See, we need to approach the Christian life as if there is a winning and losing strategy and that you're going to win. I love this picture. I love it because I can't play sports, so I could never really do it this way. But in just, just a, a little bit of me gets to do this with the Christian life. You, you look at it with a winner's attitude. I will win. Do you know why? Do you know why you're going to win? Do you realize it's already been promised? And God says you need to get out there and take the glory. Take the victory because I have equipped you. Because I have already won. Listen, maybe you need to hear it this way, okay? This is how I need to hear it. Jesus has chosen you for his team and Jesus does not choose losers. And you might be like, well, I'm, a I'm still a loser. I still feel like a loser. Maybe I was a loser most of my life. Fine. Even if you accept that, God has now made you a winner. You are on the winning team, not because of anything you have done, but because the Jesus who has come to you, to whom you have given your life, he is already overcome the world. You need to suit up and face the enemy, and be ready to receive the rewards. He is the one that has overcome the world. Already, it's done. So you're on the winning team. You will be able to fight against the habits of sin in your life. And it's not a trick. It's not a joke. You can overcome. You will overcome. You will win in this life with him, you'll be able to hear God's voice and affect change because of your prayers, because of Jesus. This is where it becomes a decision and a declaration. We need to start making these declarations in our life. This is my decision and I'm not turning from it. I am going to contend in prayer 
for the spiritual health of my family. I'm going to love my kids the way that God, the father of all creation, has loved me, and they're going to be better for it. I'm going to encourage my brothers and sisters in Christ every opportunity that I get. I will live as a servant of Jesus with purpose and with intention. Listen, and this I say this without, without any kind of conceit. I promise you I'm saying it this way. I am not saying this in a narcissistic way. I'm not saying this with an ego. People will get closer to Jesus because of my life and my decisions. And you can make that same promise too. You can make that same declaration. That's what Jesus says about you. I'll prove it. I'll prove it. Because I know that's hard to take. I know you look at people and you say, well, they must have it all figured out. They have the Christian thing all figured out. I'm going to let them shine. Even though Jesus says that all of us, all of us because of Christ, we all shine like stars in the universe because of what he's done, because of his light in our life. But you look at yourself and it's hard to think that God has chosen you for the winning team. It's hard to believe that he has turned your life around so completely. That is tough for us to accept. So here's what Psalm 84 says. Blessed are those whose strength is in you, okay? So it matters, right? It matters where you flee from and who you're going towards, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. I'm heading towards Jesus every single day. I'm taking one step closer to him. That's my plan. And here's his plan for you. I'm still in Psalm 84, verse 7. Maybe you've heard this before. They go from strength to strength till each appears before God in Zion. This is God's plan for you, church. This is his plan for you in Christ. You get better and better. You get better and better at this, at walking with him, at being the light of his kingdom, at being his child, his representative. You get better and better and better and better, strength to strength to strength until you see him face to face. That is his plan. That is his plan for everybody, not just the special elite people You are special and elite because Jesus has put you on his team, because Christ is in you. Okay, please don't ever think, I've tried and I've tried and I just keep failing, I keep failing. You are not a failure because of Jesus. So go after it. Go after it. Stay away from the things that you know are going to tempt you. Flee from it, man. I don't care who calls you a Christian nerd. I don't care, don't care about what anyone else says. His sight is the only sight that matters, isn't it? And you follow after Jesus like a, like a warrior who's going to win the battle, like an athlete who's going to make the, the winning run. I think I moved from baseball to football. I don't know. <laughs> Whatever it is, God's given you a winning strategy, and he's already made you a winner. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your promises. We thank you so much for your presence. I just pray, Father, that we remember how important it is to stay connected to you and how powerful it is. We do not have to do this on our own strength. All this is is a life of response to the grace in place of grace already given that you have given to every single one of us. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that we have something to do. Thank you that we have a winning strategy against our adversary. Thank you that we are already guaranteed the victory. I pray that you help us live in the rewards that you have already promised and that we can already receive until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, church. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you're watching early, you can still come Sunday morning. We're we're having one service right now at 945 a.m. Thanks. We'll see you next time.